All right, I think we'll get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to PNP Live. My name is Heidi, and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator of Politics and Prose. Thank you for joining us and tuning into this virtual format where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. I have the pleasure of hosting our Father's Day event this afternoon, and I'm delighted to welcome our authors, Greg Baer, Ryan Redzeski, Jordan Shapiro, and moderator Anya Kamenitz. Just a few housekeeping points before we get started. You can click the link that we will drop into the chat to get your own copy of Father Figure and When You Wonder, You're Learning, Mr. Rogers' Enduring Lessons for Raising Creative, Curious, and Caring Kids. If you have a question for our guests, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. At the end of the chat, our guests will have time to answer some of your questions. You can upvote the questions you like and want most answered. Now on to the event that you're waiting for. Greg Baer, Executive Director of the Grable Foundation, is a father and children's advocate whose work is inspired by his hero, Fred Rogers. A graduate of the University of Notre Dame and Duke University, Greg holds honorary degrees from Carlo University and St. Vincent College. In 2007, he founded Remake Learning, a network of educators, scientists, artists, and makers. He is also an advisor to the Brookings Institution and the Fred Rogers Center. Ryan Rydzeski is a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh who taught fifth grade before earning an MFA in nonfiction from Chatham University. In addition to his work for nonprofits, he writes feature stories and creative pieces that have appeared in Pittsburgh Magazine, Hippocampus, and elsewhere. He lives in Pittsburgh with his wife, Jacqueline, and their very old soul beagle, Walter. Jordan Shapiro is an author, educator, and researcher. He is senior fellow for the Joan Gans Cooney Center at Sesame Workshop and non-resident fellow at the Center for Universal Education at the Brookings Institution. He teaches in Temple University's Intellectual Heritage Program, and he wrote The New Childhood, Raising Kids to Thrive in a Connected World. He lives in Philadelphia with his two sons. And our moderator, Anya Kamenitz, is an education correspondent at NPR. She's also the author of several books. Her latest book is The Art of Screen Time, How Your Family Can Bounce Digital Media in Real Life. Kamenitz was previously a writer, a staff writer for Fast Company, and has contributed to The New York Times, The Washington Post, New York Magazine, and Slate. And it is my pleasure to turn the event over to them. Thanks so much, Heidi. And thanks to everyone who's tuning in. Um, I'm really pleased to be joining these guys for this conversation on the eve of Father's Day. And I said in my newsletter that this is going to be a festival of non-toxic masculinity. Um, and I hope that it is. Um, <laughs> Each of these books is quite different in their format and their tone um, in what they're trying to get across, but I think that they both share a sense of um, urgency for this moment uh, because, you know, we have been through just a heck of a year as parents, as caregivers, of people, as people who care about children, and the need for kind of thoughtful, intentional remaking of our bonds and our relationships with children just has never been felt um, so clearly and so broadly. Um, so I want to start by asking each of the authors, um, and Greg and Ryan, I don't know how you split this stuff up, but each of you to talk about what led you to write this book and then your reflections on what it means to be having a book like this coming out now. I'm sure you didn't predict the pandemic when you started it. Not at all. Thank you, Anya. This this book has been three years in the making. And so we had no clue of a pandemic three years ago. And for us, um, this book starts at an emotional place. You need to know about us that we're both Western Pennsylvania kids, which is critical because Fred Rogers is from Pittsburgh, produced Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood right here at WQED, America's first public television station here in Pittsburgh. And so Fred Rogers is part of the water in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, as much as um, French fries on salads or the Pittsburgh Steelers. And right at the confluence of the river sits a memorial to children and a statue of Fred Rogers, which is this reminder to us to put kids first. And that's something that this corner of the world has tried to do for the past 20 years, as we've tried to reimagine the learning landscape for our kids, not only in school, but also in libraries and museums and really create an atmosphere for learning as Fred Rogers would describe. And for us, for me and Ryan, the aha was about three or four years ago, recognizing Fred Rogers, not just as that loving, caring person whom we saw in our television visits and in that warm cardigan, but really as a learning engineer and as a learning scientist and really appreciating him as someone who had blueprints that the rest of us could follow, whether as a parent, as a teacher or anyone who cares for kids. 
And, and that feels especially important right now, doesn't it, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that struck us most clearly, and Ani, I know you've written about this. In fact, we came across your article when we were researching the book, um, was that if you talk to some of the top learning scientists, the people who know the most about how human beings learn, if you read um, the latest research, it's very interesting in that scientists are speaking in ways that don't always sound scientific. You know, they're not talking about things that can be measured. They're not talking about data. Instead, they're talking about how do you make sure that children feel safe? You know, how can we help children feel that they belong to a community that cares about them? Um, how can we make sure that they feel loved and capable of loving? It's, it's fascinating that so many scientists today, when they talk about learning, sound less like scientists and more like script writers um, for Mr. Rogers. Um, so once we realized that, we, we knew we had a book on our hands. And from there, it was a matter of um, talking to learning scientists, learning as much as we can about the learning sciences. And once we did that, we saw it in every scene of the neighborhood um, as we tried to demonstrate in our book. Jordan, what about you? Yeah. Yeah, my what 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 inspired me? Well, you know, I had done a, a, a it, it's it's interesting. I think I love that the, I love that we're doing this what this together because I I had spent years um, working on on child development science, education science, really thinking a lot about uh, about what mattered. And at some point, and I, and I wrote a book about about that already once. But then when I decided to write Father Figure, it was because I realized that so many of the images that we had of fathers and of male role models for children were really problematic and they weren't matching what any of the research had told us was in the best interest of kids. And they certainly weren't matching what we know, what we know about social justice and, gen and gender equity. Um, and so um, I, was, I was really excited to do this event. And I talked to both Greg and Ryan a, a few times while, but while they were writing their book and while I was writing my, my book, because I, it, it struck me that Mr. Rogers was this positive role model of, an, of, a, of a father figure that didn't really get talked about in that way, that, that often we saw all these other fathers and then we had this weird uh this weird one that we should all be emulating right i mean we should all be emulating him in in in, in terms of education in terms of parenting in terms of uh, uh, of anything to go with kids so so in some ways even at, even at many points and i mentioned mr rogers a few times during in father uh fig, figure that they they um, I, I really was just interested in in how do we reimagine the way we think about what uh what a dad is and what a man is um, and, and what, what those cultural signifiers can, could be in, um, in, in America, but, but certainly I'm, I'm interested beyond America, but, but, but I think a lot of the, the, the issues in, in, in my book are, are, are very U.S. specific. Yeah, I think so. And so, although patriarchy is pretty universal, um, <laughs> that, that that one's not right, not you. <laughs> more or less. I, well, it's so interesting too, though, because I think it's part of the reconsideration of Mr. Rogers that we're having right now that makes him feel so vital to me is the the appraisal of the fact that he's not only kind, but he's also quite brave, and he's brave around social justice issues and around inclusion specifically. Um, and I wonder if you can each speak to kind of that theme of empathy and moral instruction and kind of, and and really being willing to break barriers. I mean, not only dealing with integration, but also even, even the assassination of JFK and the Vietnam War and it, all these themes that he was able to take on and that children's television doesn't do. <laughs> Could you imagine a, a children's television today inviting war, assassination, hatred, things that Fred Rogers actually brought into the neighborhood? And I think, um, you know, when we turn back to our m memories as kids, we don't remember those moments per se. We remember going to the crayon factory or feeding <laughs> the fish. But as an adult, looking back at his work, you're right. I mean, there was a remarkable bravery to Fred's work. Um, he was courageous. And in fact, if you'll let me just uh, read a brief quotation, because in our epilogue, we um, quote Mary Rawson, who's an actress who played Cousin Mary Al on The Neighborhood. And she writes this about why we find such comfort, comfort uh, for Fred Rogers in today's world. And she said, in the neighborhood, violence and war, hatred and intolerance are not painted out of the picture, but neither are they allowed to destroy the canvas. And mm. um, Fred, knew, Fred respected childhood. 
And he understood that kids had big feelings and big questions about the world. Um, I've shared recently some moments that I've had with my own daughters who have mixed race and, and really you know, being challenged by violence in the world and how that's entered in my household mm -hmm. and how I've tried to learn from the lessons of Fred Rogers as I navigate those things. Fred invited the world in, but he didn't let it destroy the canvas as Mary Rawson says so well. And Jordan, what about you? I mean, you know, there's obviously a huge social justice aspect to the book, but it's also very personal. And I wonder if you'd indulge us to talk a little bit about, like, how do you instruct your boys? You're the father of two white boys. How do you instruct them? And how do you feel you're doing in that dialogue as far as bringing these things in, but not letting them destroy the canvas? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I mean, the, the so, social justice has always been at the uh, forefront of my of my parenting strategy, um, and always being willing to to have the the hard conversations with my kids. Um, you know, and I think what I talk about doing in father figure, and again, I think it's a, it's a it's a place where where Fred Rogers modeled this so well is is talk about how we one bring ways of being into our lives and our ways of embodying our role as father, our role as mother, our role as parent, as whatever we see ourselves as, but, but living into, uh, into ways that, uh, that, that express the conviction or the dedication to, uh, to inclusivity and equality and, and social justice. But at the same time, there's also an instruction level, right? It's, it's not just about, it's not just about, I model the behaviors for my kids. I have to be willing to talk to them about these things. Things. And I have to be willing to have every hard conversation, no matter what. I mean, that's always been my, my key thought. And I think we all have to do it is, you know, certainly you have to have all those conversations at age appropriate levels, not talking about things that are going to terrify kids, not talking about things that are, um, um, that, that, that are beyond their developmental capacity to reflect on. But, but, you know, from the very beginning of my kids' lives, you know, if, if there was something happening in the news and they saw something about it, I discussed it as best I could at their at, at their level. If they asked a question about sex, I you know no matter what age they were, I talked about it. If they asked a question about race, I talked about it as best I could at their their level. But and part of what inspired me to write this book was actually watching how wise they had become in questions of, of gender because the, you know, my kids are teenagers now and, and it's unbelievable um, what this next generation of teenagers is, is like. But I remember sitting at the dinner table one time and saying something about one of my son's friends and they corrected they, me and they said, you know, that's not, that's not the right pronoun. And I forget what I said in response, but whatever I said, they, were, they looked at me like, dad, you're not allowed to say that. <laughs> and I got and my and my first my first my first thought was I'm so furious at you I was like you damn kid I'm the one who taught you to be a feminist how dare you correct me like that was in the back of my head but then slowly I went you know if I'm struggling with this as someone who's put this at the center then that means there uh, uh, of everything I've done in my life then that means there's got to be so many dads who are struggling with that at a much deeper level. Um, and so that was part of what inspired me to write the book. But I also think is that ex answers the question of, of how do we both live into it um, yeah. um, and, and have the personal experiences inform the, 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 the work that we're doing. So, you know, I love that because um, I was just reading a report about, you know, connectedness and the growth of digital connectedness during the pandemic. And um, the concept of reverse mentoring, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, where, you know, the children are the ones that kind of know digital natives is silly, but they, they are out there and they're exploring. And a lot of times they're able to help elders with various aspects of technology. But I think that also is true of, right, these evolving attitudes. They're not automatically going to go in that direction, but if they are and we're willing to learn from them, how beautiful can that be? Not only, not only that, you know, they have the right answer, but just that we're modeling learning and continuing to learn. Um, and our, we can we can show that to our kids that, yeah, oh, okay, I thought it was this way, but now I'm learning something else and I'm learning it from you. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, I want to pivot a little bit and talk about another big theme. Um, I think in both of your books in a way, which is about 
you know, imagination and play as being a major aspect of kind of engagement with children. Um, and, and Greg and Ryan, I mean, and talk a little bit about that. Ryan? Yeah, so it's interesting that so much of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood took place in this sort of dreamlike world, which I know you wanted to talk about as well, Jordan, of the neighborhood of make-believe. Um, and once you understand the learning science of what Rogers was doing, it, there's really some fascinating psychology at play in the, or in the neighborhood of Big Believe. Um, but at the core of it was Rogers knew that in order for kids to wonder, in order for kids to discover what it is that makes them curious, what, what it is that makes them uh, bothered, you know, what, what is it that moves them? They need a space of their own in which to process in which to play. They just need unstructured time. You see a lot of that at play in the neighborhood of make-believe. These characters, um, as we talked about earlier, confronting big, difficult things, but doing so in a way that is both age appropriate and allows them to almost rehearse for the real world. Um, you often see, um, you know, Mr. Rogers will introduce a theme at the beginning of the program. And then the characters in the neighborhood of make-believe will uh, play it. So they'll play a game, they'll do something that resurfaces that theme in an age appropriate way. And then we come back to Mr. Rogers' real life living room and he helps us sort of unpack what it is, um, what it is that we've experienced, what it is that we've learned and what it is that we're still curious about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why is it so powerful to, to present the themes in that parallel way? You know, there's an interesting study uh, that we cite in the book called, this is just one reason it's important, um, the creativity crisis, which you might be familiar with. The, cre the basic theory behind this is that kids, as they grow older, become less creative. And there's another theory that over time, kids as a cohort have become less creative, less empathetic. There is still a lot of work to be done or trying to figure out why that is, but what the scientists are pointing to now is a lack of free time, a lack of play, a lack of this ability and freedom to process and to be curious uh, and to sort of work things out um, for yourself in a way that is intrinsically motivating. Um, I think the more we structure children's time, the more we eliminate space for play and for imagination, um, the less curious kids become, the less creative kids become, the less, um, freedom we give them to indulge those very human tendencies. And we see this in school, we see this um, in basically every place where children learn. And Anya, I'll just add that Fred Rogers famous, famously said, play is the real work of childhood, right? Which goes back to that great word Ryan just used a moment ago about rehearsal. So much about play in childhood is about rehearsing for how you manage big feelings, big ideas, um, that you have as a kid and that you learn as you grow. And in a space like the land of make-believe, where you feel like you matter, where you feel like you belong, where you feel like you're safe, both physically and psychologically, you can start to experiment and exchange ideas and build and, and take apart things and toss around ideas. And, and kids having that space actually in the world is so critically important to their development. Yeah, absolutely. Jordan, what are your thoughts about this? I mean, I, I kind of want to, this is like a little bit of a continuation of a conversation that we've had. And I know you talked about it in Melinda Wenner Moyer's um, newsletter, which was about sort of the traditional gender division of labor in the family that dads are often in the role of playmate more than moms. And I don't, I don't really have a lot of judgment about that. I think there's good and bad aspects to it. And it's also false and true. I mean, it depends. It's very different for different people. Um, but do you think that it is a, a good thing for a feminist dad to be engaged as a playmate to his kids? Is that a good idea? Well, I think it's a good idea for, for, for all parents to be somewhat engaged as a, as, as a playmate. And when I say that, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that parents should be best friends with, with, with their kids, but I am suggesting that parents' engagement in their kids' play on a playful level and on a level of sort of acceptance of the kind of play that's happening in, in, in the moment is, is super important. And, and I think it's important um, 
I mean, I, there, there's, there. I don't think there's any gender distinction in, in who it's more important from where it comes from. I mean, there, I, in, 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 if there's one thing I, I definitely learned uh, while writing Father Figure, it was, it was that the, the issues of gender when it comes to specific roles or activities connected to parenting don't, you know, the, the, the science doesn't doesn't support the idea that one parent should be doing any specific thing. Uh, either can do either. And, and I think the example you're talking about, Anya, is much more just the, me acknowledging that, uh, that, that uh, statistically, at least, uh, in, ge in general, dads tend to do, do a, you know, what dads consider the work of parenting is often the same as the work, as what Fred Rogers considered the work of, work of childhood. <laughs> and, and when, when there's a whole lot of other actual, you know, I should, I shouldn't say actual work, it's all work, but, but there's a whole lot of other hard, miserable work that is involved in, 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 in parenting. that's not nearly as rewarding or as fun as the play. Um, but I, but I would love to also say something about uh, in response to, to both Greg and Ryan ab about the land of make-believe, which is, which is what like always from the time I was a kid, the, um, well, I mean, I think for most kids, it's the most fun part of the uh, of of watching Mister Rogers' Neighborhood. But as I got older and 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 wiser, and started to uh, research psychology and started to understand it, I was always fascinated with the idea that he always he there would always be sort of an emotional issue on the show of some sort, whatever it was, some complex psychological conflict or sociopolitical conflict that he was always sort of circumambulating around um, without ever, well, sometimes hitting it directly, but but often in a, in a very um, implicit way. And then they would cut to this land of make-believe where things were actually always a mess, right? Like, like the, like the, uh, the character, <laughs> the characters are not Fred Rogers. They're not, they don't have the composure. They're angry. They're sad. They're crying. They're upset about inappropriate things. They're, they're expressing their emotions in very poor ways, often, often in the, in the land of, of make-believe. Uh, and, and I always saw it as this sort of you know, we got this picture of the mess that was Fred's brain. Like, that's what I always imagined. Like, it was his unconscious. And it was like, we would go in it, we would see that there's a total mess of voices. And that, and, 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 and that what he would then show us is what it looked like to manage those voices and articulate in a very thoughtful, compassionate, meaningful, but also controlled um, um, and, and, and uh, uh, way. And I guess the reason I wanted to say all that, and I would love to hear Greg and Ryan say something, say about about that, but but that's a really one of the core points that's in Father Figure too, is this idea that we all have these uh, all these voices in our head, and until we're willing to stop subjugating certain voices in our own heads, we're not going to be ready to stop subjugating the voices uh, that are outside of that are outside of our. Uh, uh, of our heads. And I think that's what Fred Rogers does so well is that, that even when King Friday is a total, you know, jerk monarch, like his voice is still, still matters uh, <laughs> and still needs to be engaged with by all the people and, and, and thought about. Yeah. It's interesting that you describe that as Fred's unconscious. I, I, I really like how you put that. And it's one of the great pleasures of writing this book was sitting in the Fred Rogers archives, which are housed at St. Vincent College in Latrobe. And in there are boxes and boxes of 40, 50 years worth of correspondence from children to Fred, and not just from children, often from older adults too. And the things that they confide in him are both completely heartbreaking and sometimes deeply weird and funny. And all these things, they, all those voices that you were talking about, Jordan, are present in these letters to Fred. And as we read through some of this, these documents and at simultaneously watching lots and lots of episodes of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, you can start to draw through lines from certain themes, sometimes even specific letters that had been written to Fred. Um, what was happening in the neighborhood of Make Believe was very much, I think in Fred's way, a conversation uh, with children. He was listening to them through the mail. He knew what their concerns were. He knew what they were bringing to him. And he was responding in ways that um, both delighted children and, and pushed them a little bit. And it didn't hide the sort of messiness that, um, of course, is not specific to childhood. It never really goes away. 
And it's not just the messiness in your own head. And, and Jordan, you, you started speaking to the, the voices outside your head, right? You know, this was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Um, if you look at the successor show, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, there are actually three times more adult characters than there are young characters. And it's, and it's this, this idea, this presence that learning happens everywhere. And there's a cacophony around us that we have to navigate. I mean, there's a reason that, that his program began with the frenetic jazz bars um, before we entered into that living room and started to calm down. I mean, there was the cacophony of voices in the world that we have to continuously navigate and finding our own voice and our own moral truth in that cacophony. Definitely. So people are starting to put uh, questions in the Q&A, which is great. We're gonna move to that in a few minutes. Um, both of you guys have some provocations around how we talk to children in media and in our lives. And I wanted to hear each of you talk about that and sort of draw some contrasts because you know there's some there's some speaking to children that goes on in a way that just isn't very effective and isn't very helpful I think and Jordan maybe you want to go first yeah I mean I mean I think I'll answer that question I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna put aside the the sort of obvious things about uh, speaking to children right that, that, that we all sort of um, aspire to anyway, not, uh, although I think we all struggle at the same time as aspiring to have the patience and to always have the compassion and to always, uh, 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 but, but I'm going to put that aside and talk about things I think we don't think about a lot. Um, um, and, and it's one of the things I talk about in Father Figure is the idea, and it gets to what we were just saying about social justice, and it's this idea of being willing to, I, I call them smart arguments because that's what my son calls them uh, um, uh, in, in, <laughs> to me, uh, th this willingness to, to engage with our kids as, uh, um, um, at, at least, I, I don't know how to say it. I don't want to say as equals. There's, I mean, they certainly have equal rights, but they are kids. Um, but, but as intellectual equals, I, I guess, or, or at least, you know, I tend to often try to talk to my kids the way that I would talk to a coworker, right? Which means I listen to what they're saying, even when I think it's foolish, and I try to and I try to understand it, and I try to think about it. I don't just go, you know, I, I don't patronize. I don't um, I don't come from the. Uh, I I mean, I shouldn't say I don't. I try not to. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to patronize. I I I try, I try not to come from the position of father knows best, where where I am the sort of um, authoritative final say on whether a comment is worthwhile or not. Uh, I would much rather do that the way I might do it with any of you, Greg or Ryan or Anya, and say, hey, I don't know if I agree with you, but let's explore this together and let's discuss and let me try to understand uh, um, what you're saying. You know, I think we often see a lot of parents in the effort to try to always be kind and patient and compassionate, do a little bit of, of, of over, over praising, um, which, which, um, you know, where, where anything is perfect. Um, and I don't think that sends the message to the kids that, um, there's a way to say everything is valuable without saying everything is perfect. Let's put, let's put it that way. Um, and, and it doesn't send, you know, I always used to think when we, when I would tell my kids when they would draw like crayon scribble and I would hear someone go, wow, your art is so amazing. I was like, that's going to ruin what they think art is, right? They're going to be like, well, you know, why should I take Picasso seriously if it's great art when I scribble, right? Um, so you, it's, it's great to say, hey, I love the way you use the colors. Hey, tell me about what you did here. But, I, but I, I've never been one for the, for the sort of over, over praise and, and, and um, I think you get my point. I don't even know. Yeah. Well, and, <laughs> you know I, I think about it's unfortunate that too many people equate Fred Rogers reference to your special just the way that you are as if like <laughs> you're perfect, right? Because Fred Rogers believed in hard work, projected the importance of hard work and sequencing yeah. activities. What he was conveying was the sense that you matter, that yeah. you belong, and that you deserve the opportunity to pursue your passions and interests. Um, and Anya, thinking about your question, I just want to relay quickly a, a, a personal moment. So I referenced earlier my daughter being of mixed race and my kids are, are younger than Jordan's. So they're seven and 10 years old. So the older ones, she's of that um, age where she's developing identity and, and she's recognizing that she's partly Asian American. And um, after the violence uh, against Asian Americans in Atlanta, my daughter had asked me, daddy, am I going to be shot? 
right? Which for me was the first time I'd ever heard a question like that. It came right out of the left field wall and it froze me. And it was, as if like, it was as if the lessons of this book came roaring home to me to say like, okay, Greg, you, you have to notice this question. You can't ignore it. You have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge your big feelings. You have to let her know that she's safe, both physically and psychologically. You have to acknowledge that you don't have the answers, but we're gonna talk about this and we're gonna figure out this together. And so when I think about that moment, you know, I think about the struggle that I was going through as a parent coming through that moment. And that's the, really the challenge to, to people who make media, you know, whether it's video gamers or writers yeah. or producers of shows, whether it's online or otherwise, how do we create what Fred did in the devices, the software, the hardware that we're creating for kids to really ground in what today people would refer to as social, emotional or related types of things? Um, how do we build that into those spaces in ways that allow us to talk honestly and respectfully, but also as has been said in developmentally appropriate ways with kids? And so much of it comes down to respect. I mean, I really feel like that's a common thread. Respect a, for childhood, yes. There's a Israeli psychologist named, I'm probably butchering his name, Haim Gano. And Jordan, you might be familiar with him. If I'm pronouncing it wrong, please let me know. But he wrote a book about communicating with children. I see a lot of parallels to what you just said um, in the book and what's in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. He writes, except for one safeguard, we can express what we feel to children. We can express mm -hmm. our angry feelings provided we don't attack the child's personality or character. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fancy way of saying the core message of the neighborhood, which was, I like you just the way you are. It doesn't mean we can't be angry or disappointed with someone or, or think that they've done something foolish. But I think what Gano is saying there is we can't, we want to avoid sending the message that because you messed up, you are now a defective human being. You're, you're a defective child. I think um, when you talked about respect, that quote just jumped, jumped straight to mind. I think that's really what the, the core of what Rogers, how Rogers communicated with kids. Totally. And his work is the basis of how to talk so kids will listen. Yes. Yep. Which is a, one of still a class, such a classic. Yes. Um, yeah, um, so I think we're actually ready to start to bring in the questions. I have a couple more questions of my own, but um, I, I want to make sure everyone here gets a chance to speak up. So um, uh, the need to create communities of learning. You, did, you mentioned communities in, this, in Daniel Tiger's neighborhood, but Jordan, what about you? I mean, in writing this book, are you finding a community? Are you making a community? Oh, that's a that's a, an interesting question. Um, <laughs> um, in in some in some ways, and not in other ways. I mean, there's a there's a there's a lot of um, um, backlash against the idea of putting the word feminism with uh, the word father. But there, I would, I, when I say backlash, I should say it's very very polarized. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who have been very very receptive and excited. Uh, about it and there's a lot of people who have been not excited about it and 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 that and in my experience that divide does not fall along gender lines at all as you know there's 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 equally uh, angry angry people on <laughs> and and, and multi-gendered on on both sides of the uh, of of the resistance um uh, to this to this message but what i i did do is i i spent a lot of time um in what would I call them? You know, men's groups, men's circles. While while I was while I was writing this book, mostly because I, I I you know I had always sort of avoided the idea of the like cathartic drum circle of manliness. Um, yeah. But uh, but I wanted to to sort of understand who the audience was, and what I found was a lot of men who really did want books like this. I'm not sure they would have said it. I'm not sure that that they would. Uh, I'm not sure that it was. Um, I'm not sure they, they. I'm not sure they still would say that they like the F word feminism on the front of it. But but uh, uh, what I found was that many of the issues that I was already exploring were exactly the things that they were dealing with in their relationships with their partners and their families and their children and and trying to make sense of and struggling to make sense of and struggling again to bring that almost that Mr. Rogers like level of respect was because of things they were struggling with understanding about what it meant to live at this moment in time as a dad while while 
while while patriarchy is at least on on uh, seems to be on a negative you know a downward trajectory of 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 of, of less of, of less of less and less power or less and less um, esteem every 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 day although not quick enough if you ask me but <laughs> but it certainly seems to be that direction and I guess I just saw a lot of a lot of men struggling right um everything they had learned about how to do many of those things you know um even if, if we use it mr rogers as an example for a minute often i think the idea of his sort of composure gets mixed up with the idea of typical male stoicism which i don't which is i guess why i was suggesting that i love the land of make-believe because it reminds us that this is there's no stoicism in this man there's there's just a very thoughtful um, ability to take all take the chaos and put it into intention mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah one of my favorite mr rogers lines is um i get angry but i can stop when i want to yeah like yeah. Uh, the, those two parts because <laughs> I, I have a little one who struggles with that and just that message is so important for her to hear all the time Um, and, but do, I mean, do you guys have to, has anything else? I mean, you're part of a huge about community building effort, Greg and Ryan, like in, in the learning world. Yeah. So, um, and that's, uh, you know, the work of this book really springs forth from the work that we've been privileged to be part of for almost two decades here in Southwestern Pennsylvania. Yeah. So we talk, I, we mentioned remake learning at the beginning. That's yeah. a learning network of now more than 600 schools, museums, libraries, early learning centers, out of school time programs, creative industries and campuses of higher education who yeah. are advancing relevant, engaging, equitable learning. I mean, we talked about, we talk about just-based innovation and really creating a sense, um, again, as Fred Rogers would say, an atmosphere of learning. How do we really genuinely create a sensibility that learning happens everywhere? and then support not only the young people, but also the adults in their lives to, to really think about learning pathways for kids. And it's that work of really thinking about community and how we um, develop actual real life neighborhoods um, like Mr. Rogers for Kids for Learning that um, is the basis of this work. And, and so in the book, we identify all sorts of people and organizations who are exemplifying what we describe as the Fred Method. Right? And the Fred method is nothing more than what today we would describe as whole child plus learning science equals the Fred method. And there are hundreds, if not thousands of modern day Fred Rogers who are taking advantage of maker-centered learning or technology enhanced learning and robots and other things, or, you know, or just finding ways to connect with kids and their passions and interests. And that's what we can do in communities across America and across the world. Yeah, it's really special what you have going on in Pittsburgh. Um, I've been to the, the Maker Center at the Children's Museum, and it's just like from that all the way up to the CMU, like robotics lab, like just the spectrum of learning experiences that can happen in that city. Where it's, it's really it's cool. two of my favorite places. I mean, I as an adult, like those, yeah. are, those are places for Zen thinking right there. <laughs> yeah. um, OK, there's a question about uh, what can we do to teach our sons to make them feminist men? What's the most important thing, Jordan? Hmm. I mean, I, I would say that I would say the most important thing has to do with um, b b what we. How we interact as parents I and mean, what we model um, um, is, is more important than worrying so much about what we specifically uh, teach them. Um, and, and, what, and what I talk about, I wish we had more time, I would go into a lot of detail here, but, but so much of what's in Father Figure is about the ways that we are inadvertently sending really problematic um, gender messages to our sons and our and our daughters um, in, by doing things that are completely well intentioned. Right? There's all these things in in the family experience um, and in the nor the, the the normative expectations for parenting that we uh, that we do every single day that 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 send the wrong messages um, um, about about equity and inclusivity. Um, and so and, like and what? so. 
Well, well, so much of the way we think about, I'll, I'll use uh, puberty, for example, so much about the way we think about puberty it is in terms of this arrival at a level of individuality that requires independence as, a, as opposed to recognizing that we are all interdependent, right? That, that, it, that requires learning uh, learning a, a kind of rebelliousness. I talk about it in the in the book in terms of the the the, the hero versus the king. Uh, you know, the 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 hero versus the ogre king. What we see in Star Wars, this idea that that every son is getting ready to have a big battle with his father, and his father is sort of playing into that with this sort of tough love. I'm going to teach you how to be strong and build a work ethic. And while that that's one problematic, uh, um, because you know, that kind of tough love doesn't really work. Um, but, <laughs> um, but and, and all the science is pretty clear that it, do, that it doesn't work, but also it's problematic because it starts to live into an old patriarchal archetype um, that, that, that is, hurt, is hurting all of us. I love your suggestion that we can just deprogram ourselves by thinking deeply about these stories and whether or not they actually ring true to us. And why not pick different stories? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, well, I mean, and, and so much of that in in father figure is based on the idea that if we look at the uh, at history, what we see is that it's just the stories that were picked in different eras, and the the ones that we currently have are not the ones that have been there the longest. They're just the ones that were picked for the industrial era, and so time to repick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, totally. Um, so. Craig and Ryan, how do we keep the spirit of Mr. Rogers alive in our homes? And I'll ask you to personalize it. What do you guys do? Is there anything you do differently as a result of this book? So the people engage with in your I, I love this question. Thank you um, for the first. Thank you to the person <laughs> who asked it. We had the great honor and privilege of uh, having Mrs. Rogers, uh, Joanne Rogers, write the foreword to our book. Joanne was an incredible. Uh, advocate for kids and an incredible musician, an incredible person in her own right. Um, but one of the things she writes in the foreword is that no one worked harder at being Fred Rogers than Fred Rogers. Um, I think it's so important to look at Fred and what he accomplished as a practice, as a daily practice. Fred was not a saint. He was not gifted some supernatural ability to be nice all the time. What you saw on camera was the result of deliberate intention of going to bed each night, figuring out how am I going to do better tomorrow and waking up every morning to figure out how am I going to, how am I going to treat the people around me today? And this is something, one of the many things I loved about your book, Jordan, is I see you doing this on the page, trying to figure out how can I be a better dad, a better feminist dad tomorrow based on what I learned about myself today. Um, so I think um, to personalize it, what, this, this book has changed the way I think about being a good person. I think I have been able to let go a little bit of the idea of being good, being a force for good in the world is either something you are or you're not. It's something you have to get up every single day and decide to do, decide to be. Um, it's a type of work that's never really done. Uh, or Rogers himself said, you know, it takes, it's a lifetime's work to figure out the truth about yourself, but it's worth the effort. And um, I, I agree. I think if we're going to keep the spirit of Fred Rogers alive in our homes or wherever we are, um, the first step is to choose to do so and to commit to, to doing a better job tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. I like that a lot. And Anya, I'll say that, um, you know, my, my wife and I have been challenged by our own book. Um, I think we notice things differently now. <laughs> You know, now having read Jordan's book, I just I just notice things differently. And the ways we talk about going through the discrete tasks of the week, like who's going to clean the house this week? Who's going to do the like we we think differently about it. I shared earlier um, a really big moment with my daughter in my living room, you know, more mundane moment um, early in the pandemic. I'd gone out into my garage, which looks like a scene from Hoarders, and I would found my old skateboard. I haven't been on a skateboard in probably 35 years. I used to be a, I used to be a, a little punk, right, on my skateboard. And <laughs> I, I pulled out my Madrid skateboard and I um, went down the street, no helmet on, um, didn't break a bone, and I was laughing hysterically. And I mentioned that to say what I hadn't noticed at first was that the my daughters and some of the other neighborhood girls were like running along laughing because I was just laughing hysterically. 
Well, fast forward a year, the six girls in my neighborhood now skateboard. Now I can't draw a line necessarily from A to B, but it goes to this idea that attitudes are caught, right? And Margaret McFarland, who worked so closely with Fred Rogers on each script of the neighborhood, really um, conveyed the sensibility to Fred Rogers that attitudes are caught. And they're caught not only in the big moments, but in the lots of little moments to which Jordan referred a moment ago and the amassing of all of those moments. And, um, and I think we have to be really mindful in our own households about how in each of those moments, kids are noticing, they're absorbing and their attitudes and our approach to things, whether we're in the kitchen, the garage, arguing, whatever it is, that those attitudes are caught. Totally, okay. Um, well, KDG gave me the perfect question to put a button on all of this, which is for both of you guys, all of you guys, do you think Fred Rogers was a feminist dad? Does he fit the model, Jordan? Um, well, first, let me say that the uh, that, that I, I think the question is really uh, was he a feminist father figure? Because uh, because I I, I we well, I, at least I was never in his own home. Maybe Greg or Greg was, but so I, I can't comment right. to his actual parenting. But, but in terms of the the model he gave us, um, you know, I think Fred Rogers almost fits the model. I I, I think Fred Rogers is certainly models a non patriarchal. Way of way of being embodies a non patriarchal um, um, disposition. Um, the 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 only thing I, I think that that's missing that I that, that uh, to, to turn him into a perfect sort of feminist father figure would would be more of the of the active. Uh, fight against gender equality, you know, and, and it's not that there wasn't ever anything about about it in the show, but there's so there there was also a, lo a, a lot that sort of matched the uh, the gender conventions of the time and, and didn't necessarily cha challenge them. Um, um, but I'll take um, I'll take a non patriarchal disposition over a patriarchal disposition uh, any any day <laughs> any day of, of the week. And if we could add that, and, and I sort of suspect that if Fred Rogers were still with us and still doing the show, that if you just think you know if we look at all the things going on in the world right now, I think we would start to see even more. Um, um, really intentional activism because we we definitely saw it. Um, you know, I what, the the one that's always in my head is the is the is the feet in the pool scene um, yeah. um, in the middle of the civil rights movement, um, which I, I still remember. I still remember watching. So, yeah. Well, and to that end, Jordan, I mean, I would I, I don't think Ryan and I would ever pretend to get into the head of Fred Rogers. <laughs> and we certainly were never in his household. <laughs> you know, at the, at the turn of the millennium, he offered this challenge to each of us and to himself, try your best to make goodness attractive, right? And, and part of that work, especially today, and especially on Juneteenth, is about social justice in this world. And, um, and I, I think there's no doubt uh, that in his legacy, we can embrace that challenge. Somebody once asked Fred, what what is the neighborhood? You know, what, what are you trying to accomplish here? And he didn't call it a television program. Uh, he didn't call it a, a, a children's program. He called it an atmosphere. He said, mm -hmm. it's an atmosphere that hopefully makes children feel comfortable enough to be who they are. The whole mission of Mr. Rogers neighborhood was to help children discover and grow into themselves. It was never to make them more like him or make them more like anybody else. I think that that, in a way, that sort of single-minded focus on helping children discover who they are authentically and being that person authentically, that is a feminist mission. I think that's an anti-racist mission. I think um, Rogers had his own way of doing things that maybe defies labels, uh, but we can find elements of that in so much of what he did. I love that. I really do. And I, I do see the, the common thread in the sense that like, I think dads get the message that they're supposed to make their kids be like them or follow what they say. And what a relief to give that up and to say, actually, <laughs> we can all be who we are and maybe become better versions of ourselves together. Yeah. Um, well, thanks guys for sharing this afternoon with me. This has been really fun. And, and Thank thanks to so those much. who tuned in. Thank and you. Hope people watch on the YouTube. And um, yeah, this has been great.
Well, thank you, Jordan. We're such big uh, fans of your work and Anya, the same is true of you and, and the work that you've done um, in your writing and reporting over the years. It's, it's a true honor for us to share this time with, with all of you. I've been telling all my friends, I get to talk to an NPR reporter. They're all very <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thank you all so much for sharing your insights and thank you for reminding us to keep Mr. Rogers close to our hearts and the way we interact with each other and the kids especially. So thank you all so much. Um, just a reminder that you can click the link in the chat to get when you wonder your learning and also father figure. So please jump in there and, and get these great books for yourselves. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate you spending your Saturday afternoon with us. And thank you for the great questions from the audience. And I do want to say happy Father's Day to all those dads out there and all the father figures out there. So thank you for joining us. I hope you have a great weekend.